camera? Yep. Okay. Ready. Ready. Finally. <clears throat> so, um, why are you so much into being ecologically sound? And you want it into camera, not into not talking to you, Kurt? Into camera. Yeah. Well, I started in 1970. What I started was uh, trying to be uh, an environmental activist. I started to live sustainably back then. And the reason I did it, because I had lived at that point 20 years, two decades in smoggy LA, and it was horrible choking smog back then. So I knew there was a real problem with the air, and I knew there was a problem with the water. I'd go down the Santa Monica Bay, and the water was very, very bad in the ocean. And uh, I had heard about what happened outside Cleveland. The Cuyahoga River had caught fire in 1969. So many people, myself among them, in 1970, had enough physical evidence to uh, take action and to do something about the environment. And people were talking about cleaning up the air and cleaning up the water, and a lot of people raised their hands and said, sign me up, I want to do something about that. And uh, I started doing everything I could. I, I started uh, recycling, I started composting, I started riding a bike, you know, when weather and fitness permitted, which was nearly all the time. I started to take public transportation a lot. Uh, I changed my diet to being a vegetarian and all that stuff was not only good for the environment, but it saved me a lot of money. So why is the rainforest so important to uh, planet Earth? The rainforest, well, we talk about the lungs of the planet and you don't want your lungs to uh, get into trouble when you have cancer and you have to lose even one lung, you know, you're in big trouble. And we're losing a great deal of our tree canopy uh, in the you know, in the Amazon rainforest, in the Indonesian rainforest, they're taking down trees for palm oil. Uh, they're displacing orangutans, these wonderful creatures, these beautiful uh, apes. Lots of side effects are occurring because of deforestation. But most important for our own well-being, to lose that amount of oxygen-producing tree canopy uh, is it has severe consequences. We have to keep every tree standing that we can. Indeed, we have to plant a lot more trees, not just for oxygen and taking in CO2, but to prevent, prevent soil erosion, to, uh, you know, to, to do many things, to uh, retain groundwater. Trees do a lot. They, fruit trees, of course, provide a lot of food. There's lots of different trees that have many roles, and they support a healthy ecosystem. So, if we continue to deforest, what's the outcome? If we continue to deforest, the outcome is what happened to the people on Easter Island. There's these big stone statues on Easter Island, and everybody wonders how they get there. There's lots of th how they got there. There's lots of theories about that. But uh, basically, they've looked back in the fossil record and the pollen record and ways that they can evaluate and quantify. And what happened was they deforested their way out of existence. They just took down too many trees on Easter Island many, many years ago, and it was their undoing. They, they made a decision to do that, to build boats out of trees, to build housing out of trees, whatever they did with it, to burn them for fuel, but they did it, and they went extinct. That, that, uh, that race of people that lived there, you know, that uh, indigenous group of people, they, they went extinct because they took down too many trees, and that is our fate we take down too many trees. Deregulation of the EPA. <clears throat> People are talking about um, the EPA, about deregulating it, about defunding it, about uh, abolishing it. There are many people that have that on their agenda. <clears throat> I had something in my throat. People are, talking, people are talking about abolishing the EPA, about restricting it, about defunding it. That's a mistake, because keep in mind, what happened because of the EPA and the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act signed by Richard Nixon, both those bills, we now have cleaner air in L.A. from 1970 when I started. We have four times the cars in L.A. from 1970 and millions more people, yet a fraction of the smog. How? The EPA and the Clean Air Act have enforced certain rules and we have gotten to this point now where, you know, we have a fraction of the smog and that's a huge success story. Even with all those people moving in, we didn't just keep the smog the same. We didn't roll it back slightly. We rolled it back in a major way. The EPA is responsible for that. The EPA was, is responsible for cleaning up a lot of hazardous waste. The EPA is a vital part of our ecosystem of protection for the human species. So, 
What can I do? I'm one person. How can I help save the planet? There's three things that need to happen. You have to have a balance between all three. One is personal action, and they're all related. They're all part of the same piece of furniture. You know, one is personal action to do everything that you can in your life. Two is to get government involved and have proper legislation, as we did with the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, and all of that. And three is corporate responsibility. And if you don't do all three in a strong way, you have a wobbly stool and things fall over. So uh, since they're all related, you can get government to do more by taking personal action. If you get government to do more, it's easier to take personal action. They all relate to each other in a synergistic way. So uh, corporate responsibility, if people are supporting companies that have greener products and staying away from companies that don't have green products, have a poor environmental record, then they get that bottom line message and they start to do things differently because they want to make a profit. Uh, David Brower was a very smart guy, he was a dear friend of mine, David Brower from Friends of the Earth and Earth Island Project. David Brower said, capitalism is a great idea, we ought to try it. By that he meant, you know, valuing the capital of the trees standing. They certainly have value, trees do when you take them down, you know, cut them up into two by fours or plywood or, you know, other forest products. I, I accept that that has a financial value, but don't they also have a value standing when they take in CO2? when they emit oxygen for us to breathe and many other animals to breathe, when they retain groundwater, when they, uh, you know, uh, keep soil erosion at bay. They do a lot, trees. They have whole industries of tourism and, you know, and uh, other related industries that want to be around trees. One of the common factors in many wealthy neighborhoods around the world is mature trees. People like to live around mature trees. It's easier to cool a house, you know, with the mature trees, and there are deciduous trees that you can plant near your house that also will keep, you know, the, the sun off your house in the summer months if you plant them on the south side, of course, in the northern hemisphere, and then they lose their leaves, they're deciduous, and the sun hits the glass of the house during the winter months. So trees are our friend in many ways, and uh, mature trees are, uh, have tremendous value. So if I'm... Uh, a person in, in another country from where you're at, Ed, you know, you're in the richest country in the world. Is this more American propaganda so, you know, you guys can come in and make the fortune and we have to suffer for this? Well, it's understandable that people in the developing countries are resistant to doing everything that we're promoting right away. They look at us and they say, wait a minute. How did you build the Brooklyn Bridge? How did you build the Empire State Building? You built it with high sulfur coal and polluting technologies, and we just want what you have. We need to get to where you are. And so uh, we can say to them, though, you're correct about that. We're not just saying, do as I say, not as I do. We're saying, do as I do now. You can leapfrog over the old technology. A perfect example is cell phones. You used to have to lay a phone wire you know, with RJ11 jack going to your phone, what have you, and you had to have electronic connection via wire to talk to somebody on the phone. Now, people in the developing countries leapfrog over that technology and they just get cell phones and they can talk to people in other parts of their country, other parts of the world, via cell phone. It's much cheaper than laying wire. It's the same with power plants. You know, you can have lots of more big power plants with centralized power leading, you know, with wires to the many different homes or you can leapfrog over that and have solar where you need it, power where you need it, on the hut, on the house, on the community building in the developing world. You can leapfrog over uh, old technology and save money. So, what does two degrees mean to you, the, t the tipping point, two degrees? Well, two degrees centigrade, which is what we're looking at, is uh, a huge tipping point. That means that there's some stuff that we, we cannot reverse. I think we're already at a point now where there's a lot of loss that will occur in places like South Florida, Bangladesh, the Marshall Islands. I don't think there's any stopping that, that kind of damage. And you think people are upset in Europe now and other parts of the world with refugees coming from Syria and elsewhere. Wait till there's 10 times that, 100 times that, people leaving when suddenly the, the waters have risen in Bangladesh and other parts of the world and there are many, many more displaced people that have nowhere to turn. Uh, let's see how welcoming countries are then when there's millions of people who are refugees, environmental refugees. I think we have to do something for our own well-being in every sense of the word. 
Do you believe them when they say that if that two degrees happens, that the whole bio ecosystem will melt down? Um, there's many theories about that, and they are just that theories, but there is a certain amount of evidence in the fossil record and otherwise uh, in, in geology that you can see when there was a lot more carbon in the air having nothing to do with human activity. Many years ago there was a lot of CO2 and life was very different. We can't turn the clock back and survive in that kind of a world now. It's a very different world. We need a certain amount of oxygen. Uh, most mammals do. Many uh, other creatures need a good deal of oxygen and so you can't go back to that period uh, from years ago when there's a, um, that amount of CO2. There's a nice Goldilocks syndrome with oxygen and many other things in temperature. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's right in the middle. It's just right. And you start messing with that and you start to have feedback loops from the, the methane being released from the permafrost, let's say. You go up to the tundra and that methane is starting to be released now because it's getting warmer up there. Permafrost is being heated and the methane comes out. Now you have, like you have with a microphone, a feedback loop where it's getting louder and louder and now woo -woo, it makes that whistling sound because there's a feedback. And that's what we're having now. The, it, the rate at which the temperature is increasing is logarithmic. And so uh, when you have that happening, you have serious danger afoot. So they're talking about if this two degrees happens, there will be flooding, we'll lose all low-lying island countries and cities. Isn't that just people trying to scare us? There was a time when people thought, uh, you know, this is uh, some conspiracy by folks trying to scare us, getting us to do what? I mean, uh, they say...